This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. Today we'll be talking about the way that manufacturers evaluate and invest in new technologies. And for insight, we're turning to JBIL Circuit, one of the largest contract manufacturers in the world. It's a company that's responsible for producing lots of different products for lots of different companies at every scale from five units to 100 million units. Among other digital technologies, JBIL has invested in additive manufacturing, and they've made some surprising discoveries about the economics of 3D printing. It turns out to be much more competitive with injection molding than you might think. But first, an exciting announcement. The Digital Factory Report is available now at digitalfactory.xyz. This is a comprehensive overview of advances in artificial intelligence, automation, and 3D printing, and how they're changing the manufacturing ecosystem. It's free, and if you're at all involved in design, engineering, or manufacturing, and I assume that's almost all of you, you'll want to read it. Download the Digital Factory Report at digitalfactory.xyz. Our guest today is a featured expert in the Digital Factory Report. He's John Dolcinos, the Vice President of Digital Manufacturing at JBIL Circuit. John, thanks for coming on the program. It's great to be here. So before we get started, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about exactly what JBIL does. You're a huge manufacturer with an equally uh, wide range of manufacturing processes. We are. Jable's a, uh, you know, today Jable's a $20 billion company with 100 factories and close to 200,000 employees. Uh, And we operate in 20 or 30, uh, 25 to 30 countries around the world. Um, You know, but I think that at the core, we help companies make things. And, you know, years ago, that meant just simply taking a manufacturing process that was well-defined and uh, delivering it. Today, uh, it means starting with customers uh, at the concept stage or even at the ideation stage, helping them bring a product to market and build out a uh, strategy to produce it uh, and um, deliver it on a global basis. So you're you're a contract manufacturer, and and I imagine that some of your uh, customers come in with a clear idea of how they want something manufactured, and others come in with an end product that they want, and then they ask you to figure out uh, how to produce it. What's kind of the ratio there? Uh, f- Fifteen years ago, it was. Uh, 90, 10. So 90% of our customers came with a, an existing manufacturing process with, uh, um, with work instructions and test instructions. Today, it's probably uh, the opposite of that. Probably 10% of our customers come to us with a completely finished solution set around a product and, and, and all the bill of materials and work instructions, test instructions to do it. Uh, that's very rare today. Uh, and it's just because products are so complex, the level of specialization it takes to bring a product to scale, figure out the supply chain, figure out all the interdependencies and in the bill of materials, uh, figure out the, the, um, how to optimize it for cost and optimize it for delivery and logistics are, are really complex topics that really take a uh, cross-functional organization to do it. And so in many cases, we're partnering with our customers to help them work through those complex solutions and deliver the most optimized uh, manufacturing solution. So then this means that you all have a real opportunity to, uh, you know, to be the introduction point for new manufacturing technologies. We are. uh, We spend, I work out of our Silicon Valley uh, tech center here uh, called Blue Sky. And, you know, what we, uh, what we have here is a mass, uh, just a, a wide range range of really state-of-the-art manufacturing processes. And in many cases, uh, we're introducing our customers to what the real capabilities are. I mean, I think when you think about product development, there's a, there's a whole focus on how do you deliver a solution to a customer uh, that, is, uh, that is optimized for their, for their application or problem set. But there's a whole other side of that, which is how do you make it? And, and what are the technologies that really enable you to push the envelope on the design side with corresponding solutions on the manufacturing side? And so in many cases today, we're showing our customers who are the top brands in the world, we're showing them what's possible 
for new technologies like printed electronics or uh, active alignment or 3D printing or other technologies and showing them what that can enable so they can go back then and apply that towards the problems they're trying to solve for their customers and create products that are uh, manufacturable. Now let's talk for a minute about your role as head of digital manufacturing. JBill is a big CM with a lot of clients in different industries working on different kinds of products. So you've got this incredible high level broad view of the manufacturing ecosystem and of technologies and, and how they're uh, working in different applications. When you begin to evaluate a new technology, how do you get started? Well, I think when you started looking at something new, I th- you uh, at least from kind of the way we think about it, we start at the trends and we look at you know kind of where where's where's our customer base going, where's their customers going, and what are potentially uh, enabling technologies or disruptive technologies that can intersect with some of those longer term directions and trends, and uh, and we uh, we kind of down select to a very small set of those because you can only invest in in a handful of things and do them well. Um, and so uh, when we can see a, a long-term trend with a disruptive technology that we think has has an intersection point in the next three to five years, then we start with seed investments as you would in any startup um, and, and, and frame up what the potential is and where the areas are that that seem to either have the highest risk or seem to have the best opportunity to really push that technology forward. And we uh, we focus on building up a, a base capability that allows us to um, to really understand uh, what's possible and what it enables. And then we try and connect that to uh, some of these uh, either leading edge customers or or trends to uh, to find some applications that we can start to to build some credibility and use cases around. In in a lot of companies, uh, you're able to take a new process and maybe use it in uh, prototyping first or in small batches first before exposing a larger you know production environment to something new. Um, are you able to isolate like that, or or as a contract manufacturer, are you always only thinking of uh, production runs? You know, my uh, one of my uh, former bosses uh, here at Jable had always characterized, uh, you know, kind of this thing where he said, "Think big, start small, fail fast." <laughs> um, and it's and it's very true because you know you need to have a long, uh, you know, a, a long term vision of where you're going and where where the future looks like. Uh, but you don't you don't start by doing something big, you start by doing something very small. And, um, and, you know, kind of as Jabel has introduced new technologies, it always starts with, with a really simple, small use case that gets a level of, of confidence in what's possible. And then we go to a more substantial proof of concept, maybe in a, uh, so, th- so that would happen in a lab and happen in a, uh, in, in our tech center. If that's successful. Then we may go to one of our factories and find a an application that is not um, high risk and and generally very small and we'll prove it out there and then from there if it looks promising then we'll go to a bigger deployment maybe in that factory or we'll find a second location where we can kind of revalidate the results and once we have enough confidence that, that these steps have proven successful then we'll think about what's the strategy to scale this and how do you take this to a, uh, to a bigger, broader population across the company. So are you able to say how many SKUs you all make uh, every year? No, I, what I can say is that, because uh, I, I just have no idea. <laughs> well, we work with 250 of the largest brands in the world. And these companies are in consumer electronics, they're in automotive, they're in uh, aerospace, they're in medical, uh, they're in um, industrial applications. And uh, so um, in some products we make, we make hundreds of millions of, of, uh, of a single SKU for, uh, for some customers. Mm-hmm. Other products on the other end of the spectrum, we may make five or 10 if it's a really complex piece of capital equipment, uh, we might make only five or 10 a year. And so um, you know, there's a tremendously wide range of, of things that we, uh, that we do. 
So you work with a very wide range of products and customers. And I imagine that often when you invest in a new technology, that investment is really driven by a particular customer with a particular product uh, that has specific requirements. So how easy is it to uh, translate and generalize a new technology that you've developed for, uh, for one customer and one product and make it valuable across lots of different products? Well, that's, uh, uh, you know, I think that's really one of the uh, cornerstone um, principles around, you know, uh, a company like Jable. So we don't, we don't own any product IP. We don't uh, brand anything. Um, what we do have expertise on, or we do really have core IP is around process IP. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the, one of the keys for us, which is valuable for us and actually exceptionally valuable for our customers is the ability to, to solve a problem in one market and then take that solution and apply it to uh, to another market and, and make the connections. You know, a great example is uh, uh, we do an awful lot of work in the mobile phone mm -hmm. world. And you, know, you kind of look at uh, an embedded camera, and Jable has uh, really some tremendous IP around, around uh, design and manufacturing processes around uh, cameras and mm -hmm. optics. So you, know, you kind of look at that mobile phone camera, you know, which has a certain use case and what's really great about um, the mobile phone industry. It's one of the most amazing commoditizers of technology uh, that the world's ever right, seen. Right. You know, when you produce when you produce two billion of something, you drive things to a scale and a cost point and a level of reliability and a form factor that um, you just can't do it much smaller numbers. So that same camera that we, uh, that we may work with a phone company on, uh, we've integrated into a, uh, into a medical device, uh, for a feeding tube so that uh, a nurse, when she's putting a feeding tube into a patient can actually, uh, see that it's going down the right tube, mm -hmm. um, before she, uh, before she starts feeding or that same technology, uh, we can work with an automotive company to build it into their, um, into their autonomous vehicles uh, stack of, uh, of technology. So that ability to cross fertilize across industries is really valuable. And I think if you look at most of the innovations that have occurred over the last hundred years, it, it's largely an adaptation of an idea that came from some other body of science or some other industry and got applied in a slightly different way to solve a problem in another sector or another industry. So uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about 3D printing. You've uh, you've done some really interesting work around 3D printing with some surprising conclusions about the uh, the cost structure of 3D printing. Could you uh, could you describe a bit about how you use additive at uh, at Jable? Sure. Uh, you know, additives are really uh, um, just like I think many of the digital technology stacks. Additives are really interesting solution set in that. Um, at the core, it's just another manufacturing process, and uh, and so you know it needs to have a level of of manufacturing rigor and repeatability and process controls and things that you would expect uh, when you're when you're leveraging a manufacturing tool to do to do a um, to solve a problem. So there's a whole set, and we've spent a tremendous amount of our time on my team building out the you know how do you certify it. To a level of uh, of uh, standard, depending on the application in the industry, but at the other but at the other side of that, um, additive manufacturing is uh, it has the potential to 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 really fundamentally change or disrupt the way businesses run. The ability to produce product without tooling um, and fixturing really opens the door to solving a whole. Uh, you know, solving a wide set of problems in a completely different mm -hmm. way, you know, and that's, uh, that's really, really interesting. So for us, um, we see it as both another manufacturing process at one level where we'll use it for things like fixturing and tooling applications and manufacturing aids in our factories. But on the other side of the equation, we'll see it as a disruptor that opens the door for customized and personalized products or consolidation of uh, builds the materials into uh, much smaller sets of numbers. Yeah, you know, that's that's an idea I talk about a lot on this podcast, that conventional manufacturing methods involve a lot of upfront tooling cost and a tooling cost every time you change something. 
and injection molding is the classic example of this. Uh, and it means that uh, if you could get rid of these retooling costs, then you could start to manage hardware a lot more like the way that you manage software as kind of a continuous process rather than something where you're releasing uh, you know, a completely separate product revision just every couple of years. Yeah, I think what's really uh, um, interesting to me is that uh, anybody who's uh, gotten an MBA in the last uh, 50 years uh, and took a class on product management, you know, everything you did or taught was, okay, how do I take oh, as wide a set of, of markets and pull them together and group them together into something that I can satisfy with the minimum set of SKUs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, kind of 3D printing completely flips that around and says, you know what, you know, the cost of producing 10 different variants uh, is no more expensive than producing one variant uh, that's test, you know, 10 times the volume. And so what it's really going to open the door to is, you know, once product management kind of understands this way of thinking, you know, it's going to allow really uh, the world to think about products in far more segmented, far more targeted ways. So you've made some surprising discoveries around the break-even points between injection molding and 3D printing. What are you seeing there? Well, I think one of the things that's, uh, that's really been exciting in 3D printing over the last uh, five years is, is there's been some really great innovations across, um, across the, the core tool sets, the printers, that have really changed the economics of printing. Uh, you know, and, and you know, five years ago, a break-even point between an injection molded part and a 3D printed part may have been in hundreds of units, maybe you got to a thousand if you were if you were lucky. And that and that kind of break-even point is driven by a pretty simple model, which is there's an upfront tooling cost with a uh, injection molded part. And as you amortize that that upfront tooling cost, which is typically thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars across a number of parts, there's a point where that amortized cost gets low enough that um, it gets, it becomes at, at when you get to scales of millions of units, becomes uh, almost insignificant. Uh, right. 3D printing, on the, on the other hand, has no cost basis um, from a upfront tooling cost, and so it's a pretty linear, straight line cost model. If you're producing one part, if you're producing ten thousand or hundred thousand parts, and so those break-even points where those two lines cross uh, used to be in hundreds of units, but with the innovations that have occurred over the last uh, five years. We've seen that move into tens of thousands, you know, kind of low tens of thousands, as much as thirty or forty thousand units, um, and you know that starts to move up into some some really interesting applications uh, that uh, the three D printing is now viable for, from purely a cost basis compared to traditional injection molding processes. And and what kind of stuff are you are you manufacturing now with uh, with three D printing? Uh, we're we're producing things across uh, really a uh, kind of a wide swath of of industries, you know, and I think the applications fall into um, kind of three three buckets. Uh, one is uh, we're doing applications where um, a uh, uh, parts have low volumes, let's say uh, five thousand, ten thousand units. Uh, and uh, in general, a lot of times they're internal components to uh, to products. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a uh, you know a printer, a piece of capital equipment, or a uh, or an industrial product. And because we're not having to do upfront uh, investments in tooling, three D printing is a, a better alternative at these lower volumes. Second application set that we're seeing is uh, what we call bill of materials consolidations. We've got some uh, some really great use cases now where we've taken products that were um, 5, 10, 15 components, and in, in one case, 39 components, and we'll reduce that down to one or two 3D printed parts. You know, mm -hmm. And so you eliminate all of those manufacturing processes that it would take to combine these, these parts and assembly. We call it kind of moving from physical assembly to digital assembly. Yeah. So it's, so it's not just a matter of uh of you know finding the break even point and doing uh 3D printing for volumes lower than the break even point you're actually now designing things for 3D printing and and using the technology to make parts that would otherwise 
not be possible to make in that form uh, conventionally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and it's uh, and it's really exciting because it um, you know that's where the real that's where three D printing becomes more disruptive and, and more than just simply a manufacture another manufacturing tool. Tell us a bit about the kinds of machines that you're using at Jabil. Are they principally uh, desktop machines run in parallel, or are they big industrial machines? Uh, we use, uh, at, at the size that Jabil is, we use a really wide set of, of uh, 3D printing tools. Uh, we, use, we have um, uh, hundreds of desktop uh, 3D printers in our, in our company. We also have, have dozens and dozens of uh, industrial printers you know, across SLA, SLS, um, FDM, um, mm-hmm. really the kind of the full range of polymer solutions you know and, and really i think one of the one of our one of our views is that there is no one technology that's you know the winner in 3d printing really every set of technology has has pros and cons and applications where it's better suited to and applications where it's less suited to and, and what we really try and do is we just try and match the the technology with the problem we're trying to solve and trying to optimize the uh, the economics around that. So you mentioned earlier the the difficulty of uh, certifying additive manufacturing and making sure that it matches uh, you know the digital files that you're that you're putting in. Um, machine tools uh, have have become incredibly precise and very reliable in this respect. Um, how how are you finding the experience of using not just uh, you know additive but so many different additive technologies and trying to reconcile them? Well, I think it really kind of, um, when we kind of think about certifying a manufacturing process, you know, you kind of start at the use case and work your way backwards, and you know, kind of mm-hmm. depends on on what you're producing um, as to you know what do you really need to ensure that you can guarantee, you know. So, you know, if you look at producing a uh, a uh, um, a low value uh, trinket that you know is somebody's um, trophy. And compare that producing a uh, a medical device or an aerospace part. You know what you need to solution is two fundamentally different problem sets. But you know, from our viewpoint, what really at the end of the day we try and drive is how do you provide, how do you how do you um, characterize the manufacturing process, um, and, and how do you define the requirements for the application, and uh, and and really kind of build. A, um, uh, a framework that allows you to ensure that you can produce that product over and over again to a level of tolerance and consistency uh, that satisfies the requirements. And so that's that's a uh, that can be a significant undertaking when you're looking at a uh, an aerospace part or a medical part that has to have uh, traceability and has to essentially be um guaranteed that you're delivering what you said you're delivering mm-hmm. versus a part that doesn't have to have that and so we have we've got uh we've got a very detailed framework of how we think about that and uh and we apply it to whichever printing solution makes sense for the given application so we've talked mostly about 3d printing but you're responsible for all sorts of new digital technologies used in manufacturing so what are the other broad groups of New technologies that you're spending your time and mental effort on these days. Well, uh, you know, obviously, 3D printing is a great uh, a great digital technology. I call it uh, digital ready um, hmm. manufacturing process uh, because it doesn't. You don't really have to take advantage of the digital aspects of it, but obviously, because you can go from a digital file to a uh, a product without having to kind of step out of uh, the digital uh, thread. You know, it's, it certainly has some some really be- some really great benefits. Uh, you know, we're also investing quite a bit in uh, uh, robotics and automation. You know, kind of mechanizing manufacturing processes. You know, obviously to save labor, which is uh, important, but also in many cases to deliver a level of precision and a level of repeatability and a level of adaptability that you just can't get with uh, with people. And so, uh, we're investing a lot there. And then on the uh, on the data side. Uh, we're really working uh, to 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 interconnect our factories, interconnect the tools and stations we have in our factories, and start to you know kind of move manufacturing from a physical activity 
to a information driven activity that allows us to really optimize our, our uh, factories. Yeah, let's talk about uh, what you're seeing in the robotics field. A lot of people are interested in collaborative robots that work alongside human workers. Um, is that the avenue that you're pursuing, or are you more interested in making upgrades to conventional robots to make them, you know, smarter and faster and more precise? Uh, like all things, it's uh, there's a um, the right tool for the right application. You know, for us, uh, we've got uh, you know a number of applications that require the precision or the strength or the speed of of traditional industrial robots, uh, and and you know our factories have thousands and thousands of those kinds of solutions. Uh, we also have a number of collaborative robots. Uh, you know, really like the idea of of robots working with people. You know, I think in many applications that you look at, um, robots are still relatively primitive to to people, and uh, you know, a lot of tasks that we have in our factories. It's very it's very easy to take about sixty or seventy percent of the task and mechanize it because that's repeatable and, and the technology can handle it. But that last twenty or thirty or forty percent, depending on the application, could be extremely expensive and complex to try and automate it. And so you know you kind of think about a future where collaborative robots can work right alongside people and and can offload the simple stuff. And keep people inter interconnected to them doing the more complex tasks. I think is going to be a really exciting uh, way for us to think about how we uh, how we mechanize our factories in the future. So you've been in this field for a while. You have a lot of experience. I imagine that you've seen a lot of trends uh, come through in manufacturing technology. Do you feel like things are moving appreciably faster now than they have in the past, or are the current trends just a kind of repackaging? of uh, things that you've seen for a while now? Uh, you know, I think it's like, uh, I think I forget if it was Einstein or whoever uh, said this, but, you know, it just, you know, it, we always overestimate the impact and uh, absorption of new technologies in the near term. And in many times we underestimate the long-term impact of, uh, of these technologies. You know, there's a tremendous amount of, infrastructure and inertia that's in place today that's that's kind of built around a legacy uh, way to think about manufacturing. And that's a lot of work to kind of overcome. 3D printing is a great example of that. You know, while there's some really promising uh, capabilities and use cases and technology out there today, uh, the reality is that uh, there's a huge, huge learning curve we need to go through to to bring designers up and bring manufacturing engineers and, and so forth up on the technology and really comprehend what they can really do. And we really need to change a whole ecosystem to, uh, to ultimately make the impact. And so digital is certainly impacting our factories today. You know, and every year we're adding more and more digital technologies. Uh, but I think we're still many years away from a fully digital factory where, you know, basically computers are running everything that goes on and, and there's very little human intervention. Right. And it's uh, and it's always a matter of rethinking the whole thing and not just, you know, introducing individual technologies at individual steps without uh, reworking what happens around them. Yeah, it's complex. And, you know, I think that there's always uh, it's, you know, so Jabel has 100 factories today uh, in uh, in in a wide set of countries. You know, it's just not practical for us to uh, go in and throw everything away and start over. And, you know, I think one of the one of the big challenges around the digital world is that there's so much, there's such a wide set of technologies and machines and equipment from from so many different vintages that you know there isn't a one size fits all to basically say let's all connect, let's connect all our machines. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a it's a it can be an arduous press task because of the interoperability of all these uh, solutions. So. That it will be, uh, it will take time to kind of move all of that stuff to a uh, to a fully digital world. So let's move on to the recurring question that I ask at the end of every podcast. I ask every guest who comes on here about their favorite tool. So John, tell us about your favorite tool. Sure. Well, I'm a uh, uh, I like to cook, and uh, uh, you know I'm a mechanical engineer by by background. So you know one of my favorite tools are a good set of knives. It's just, you know, I think if you look at anything you're going to do in the kitchen, 
Uh, chopping is such a core part of it. And there's just nothing like chopping with a really good, solid, sharp knife that just kind of glides through it. And the sound it makes when the, uh, <laughs> when the knife hits the cutting board is, uh, it's a, uh, it's really an enjoyable thing for me. So whose knives do you use? Uh, I use uh, Henkel knives. Oh, great. German, German knives. Yes. German knives. Yes. And how do you keep them sharp? Uh, I sharpen them myself. Uh, I like to hand, I like to do the, I guess I'm old school. I like to take them and just do it on the, uh, on the hand, um, on the hand sharpener. Well, John, this has really been a pleasure. John Dolcinos is the Vice President of Digital Manufacturing at Jabel Circuit. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. John Dolcinos is featured in the Digital Factory Report, which you can download for free at digitalfactory.xyz. It's an overview of artificial intelligence, automation, and 3D printing, and how those fields are changing the manufacturing ecosystem. Again, the Digital Factory Report is available now at digitalfactory.xyz. This program is edited by Inky Stainsworth. For the Digital Factory Podcast, I'm John Bruner.